بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ سو فرسٹ آف آل آئی ٹو تھینک اینڈ وی آر گریٹ فل ٹو آل ممبرز ریسپیکٹڈ اسکالرس اینڈ علماء اینڈ کمیونٹی لیڈرس ہو ہیو بین ود اس ٹو ڈے ہی اینڈ دس ایوننگ ان دس سیشن اینڈ اسپیشلی آ تھینکس اینڈ گریٹ فل نیٹ اینڈ ڈیپ ہارٹیڈ گریٹیچیوڈ to the two respected and highly esteemed scholars and the guest speakers for their great work and excellent presentation and offering great knowledge and information regarding this given topic. Jazakum Allahu khairan, may Allah give you all great reward. With regard to this topic, which is uh, quite important and it has a great effects on the history but this is not very much challenging as we had discussed in the previous because uh, from the both side the position of imam al hasan it has been accepted uh, from ahl sunna imam al hasan he was khalifatur rashid and he was imam al hidaya imam of guidance and imam al taqwa the sign of great taqwa from the other side all these position have been recognized plus and he was divinely appointed as we have heard uh, from dr saifuddin and uh, plus khalifatur rashid so there is no much differences however they are but they are consequential with regard to the khilafa and the succession to the holy prophet what is was depended on the election or divinely appointed we have discussed already uh, the succession to the prophet the issue of imama and the election of hazrat abu bakr siddiq the first caliph and the rest of the caliph and the position of khilafat ur rashida and imama all of them so today we are not going to take to take uh, any question regarding uh, this topic please uh, remember we had already discussed and uh, Uh, I'd like to request you all to visit, you know, the uh, SIMS events and uh, that's available on the web and you can have the all information and the lie and the arguments from both sides here. Now I have to clarify the areas of questions here and uh, the questions, you know, should be around these areas uh, because these are the major areas in order to complete the topic. the nature of the election of imam hasan for example this is the very important area and you have heard a lot from both respected scholars and uh, another area is the reasons behind the act of the abdication of imam hasan was is completely on his rida uh, consent or due to the external circumstances and the challenges this is very important areas and there are discussions and the confusion the qu- questions may be raised around it and uh, there is another important area for example the conditions of the agreement this abdication there must be some conditions the question may be raised and also that would not be out of the place because there are some rumors regarding the multitude of the marriages of imam hasan and uh, especially in the spheres of the nawasib right not ahl sunnah so uh, we would like the shia scholar especially if they could uh, shed the lights over it right and uh, obviously finally i would say here the position of the opponents of imam hasan when he was khalifatur rashid and imam al ata ita obviously the position of his opponent who opposed and did not accept his authority uh, this is another important areas of questions and please brief and precise in asking your questions your contributions and additions and you may ask some other questions as well what you got in your mind precisely and uh, that's all from me today now i'd like to hand over the mic to uh, brother dr ali raza bhojani to proceeding the task please dr ali raza 
Thank you, Dr. Khaled. So I can see already people have started raising their hands um, virtually. Um, so um, please, those who would like to contribute um, to make a comment, um, raise your hand on the Zoom function. I'd also request you to open your cameras so that we can see you when you speak. Um, and uh, as we've been um, requested, try to make your comments and contributions um, reasonably concise. And forgive me if I, at some points I try to hurry you up because inshallah we would like to have a dynamic um, and useful conversation. Um, so I will go in the order that I can see the hands which have been raised. Um, and so I see uh, Sayyid Hassan Rizvi, um, who I believe is joining us for the first time from Florida. So you're very, very welcome, Sayyid. And um, please, um, we would love to hear your, your comments and contributions. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Uh, thank you once again to the to uh, Sims for, I mean, that's how you pronounce the uh, abbreviated version, right, Sims? Okay. Right. Uh, for putting this together uh, and for all the ulama who are present and for the presenters and everything. So uh, I thought that this may have been addressed by uh, either of the, the respected speakers, but since it wasn't, I wanted to ask and see what your thoughts on from both the Shia, uh, Shia theological, historical perspective, and of course, from the Ahl Sunnah perspective, is that some bring forward uh, this claim or evidence that there was an ikhtilaf between Imam Hussein and Imam Hassan alayhim salam regarding the position of the sulh and what went forward. So without you know, me opening up or giving the details, if each of the speakers uh, would be so kind, if they could explain whether they accept such a thing, if they do, what are the sort of implications, again, theologically, historically, et cetera, uh, and then maybe uh, you know, enlighten us, inshallah. Um, so please, maybe I can pass that back to... Um... To either of the uh, the speakers, if you'd like to respond, Dr. Saifuddin, um, do you have any comments there? And then we'll move. Well, I, I, I don't know the historical. You see, those are. I mean, that's what I was reading. I was reading both Shia literature and then the historical literature, academic literature on the so uh, topic. Whatever was written there, whatever was happened. I mean, theologically, of course, Shias don't agree with this this kind of dispute between imams because we know that from the um, from the, the the early times, the, the amount of respect that Imam Hussein had for Imam Hassan, you know, he would never, I don't think, you know, he would raise his voice or or, or um, challenge him publicly, challenge Imam Hassan publicly because of this, you know, respect, uh, you know, the Arab culture as well as, of course, the the, the religious, uh, the, the religious education wouldn't allow that, but. When we look at historical evidence, historical writings, you know, first of all, most of the historical writings are coming from the the, the uh, Sunni sources. What I'm saying, Sunni sources, the, the Umayyad uh, historians, and of course, they would uh, meddle with things uh, when they are writing those those um, his historical works. And it it took a considerable time for these um, these events to be recorded in the books. And of course, these these uh, one of the actually argument was against um, Imam Hassan was that he was he was wrong to uh, appoint Ibn Abbas for his army. He, he had a misjudgment. But when we look at the you know when because when we look at the the evidence that Ibn Abbas was his cousin and he had two of his sons killed by Muawiyah in the, in the wars in the Muawiyah. So he was. You, one would expect him to be more uh, loyal to him, but he didn't. So, of course, you know, there are attacks against Imam Hassan and then trying to meddle things with the thing, but I don't think that would happen. And from the uh, Shia point of view, of course, the, the, the theologically, we, we can't accept it, but historically, we can't simply know what happened there exactly. That's, that's what I can say. Thank you. Um, Sheikh Atabek, would you like to comment on, on, on this question which has been raised? <laughs> uh, thank you, Sadiq. It's just a very beautiful question. Obviously, um, uh, definitely what uh, uh, Sheikh Saifuddin has mentioned is very profound. I agree with him. However, just a few points. Just um, um, So anyway, uh, it's correct what Sheikh Saifuddin said. It is mentioned in the sources of Ah Ahl Sunnah. Okay? Ibn Athir mentions that uh, when um, after the first khutbah of Imam Hassan, uh, in which he was not agreeing okay, to accept the conditions of Muawiyah, but actually he was uh, um, um, appealing to the audience, to the people, saying that Muawiyah is offering. What do you guys want me to do? Shall we go? So after that, uh, there was conversation, according to what Ibn Athir says, 
um, uh, Imam Hussein says that, uh, so Imam Hussein was not happy to go with that and saying that, don't you remember what happened to your father with this Muawiyah and now you are going, to... so, uh, but uh, exactly as uh, Sheikh Sefuddin mentioned, uh, I do not personally believe in the historical things because the, um, uh, the pure academia in history does not exist. Okay, the main historians, they were, uh, they, did, they did belong to some certain political, maybe schools of thought or maybe um, different um, theological schools. So, so they do have their own background to, from which they will be coming to the, to the events. Okay, so that is one thing. But um, one thing I do genuinely believe, he has been in order, in order to humiliate him, uh, most likely during the second khutbah in which he was expressing that he's willing to go. So in that, maybe he has been insulted. And it is actually mentioned in our sources, in the source of Ahl sunnah mainly written by um, our Shafi Mashaya. Um, so they do mention that uh, they are uh, uh, attributed to the Khawarij, saying that you became mushrik, you became, and actually he has been stabbed on his uh, thigh and he has been taken like a, like a, and the uh, very loyal people surrounded him to defend while delivering khutbah because these um, people uh, panicked again, as usual, saying you became mushrik and your father was mushrik. Now you are repeating his mistake. How you are going to go to, with that? It doesn't mean that you do not believe that you are on the true path. And if you believe on the true path, so then why you are betraying the, that type of things? Um, so that was from the people. And I don't think it is from Imam Hussein. Um, and even if there was some type of disagreement of uh, in opinion, so it could be in very privacy and not in front of the people. It's exactly for the same reason in which they had very high respect towards one another, okay, Imam Hassan to Imam Hussein, so, uh, between them both. And also, we should not forget that um, the uh, the main historical um, books are written either by Umayyads or either by Abbasids. And Abbasids, even though they are from Ahl al-Bayt, according to both Hanafis and Shafi's. Uh, however, um, they do have some certain uh, frictions between them, isn't it? Okay, so Abdullah al Mahal, okay, so Ibrahim. So, so anyway, um, uh, so th that is the thing. So it is in our sources, yes, it is in the source of Ahl it, You can find this conversation between Imam Hussein when he was blaming his brother Imam Hassan. You can find it in Ibn al Asir, in Kamil of Ibn al Asir. Thank you. Asantum. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I, I'm gonna, I, I've taken note. I know there's a number of you have raised hands. So I will, inshallah, come to you. We have, we have plenty of time, all right? So if I turn now to um, Sheikh Muhammad Omar Ramadan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Jazakallah khair, Dr. Bujani. And Jazakallah khair to the two presenters, Sheikh Saifuddin and Dr. Uh, Sheikh Atabek for presenting this program. I just want to say a few things. One is this narration that is found by Ibn Athir referring to what the Khawarij did when Imam Hassan delivered his khutbah. I think this is a total fabrication and this was confirmed by Sheikh Mahmoud Saeed Mamdou simply because logic does not accept that such a thing happened. Imam Hassan would have not sat with people who would have called his father a kafir. The Khawarij very openly came out and said Imam Hassan, Imam Ali alayhi salam was a kafir. So Imam Hussain, when Imam Hassan did become the Khalifa, Imam Sayyuti says one of the biggest challenges he had, not only with fighting Muawiyah, was also fighting the Khawarij. So I don't really accept those narrations. I think those narrations have been made, like Dr. Khalid alluded to regarding Imam Hassan getting married 300 times, a pure insult to Imam Hassan. And the agenda behind that was to give legitimacy to the leadership of Muawiyah. That is what I believe. In regards to this issue of fabrication, I personally, what I researched is Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah has a great diversity in its opinions regarding it. Yes, we don't have per se a formula for Khilafat. And, and like I've said on many occasions, for us, Khilafat is not conditional upon being greatness, of the superiority. Anyone can be a Khalifa, anyone can be a leader, as long as he fulfills a certain criterion. We believe Khilafa Bataniya is of the, that's why we believe Imam Ali is Imam al awliya he is the Imam of everyone. However, saying that, the question comes, and this was mentioned by Ibn Hajar al-Haythami in his Sawaik al-Muhrika. 
he mentions that from all the five khulafa, the only khalifa whose khilafat is proved from the nasi hadith or from the, the nas of the Prophet ﷺ is Imam Hassan al-Mujtama. And he refers to the hadith in, in Bukhari. I don't want to go through the hadith. All the scholars know about any... Uh, when Imam Hassan ala jambi yanzuru ila nasi maratan wa ilayhi marra about wala alana an yusliha bi bihi bayna fi'ataini min al-muslimin I don't want to go through the hadith Ibn Hajar says this hadith is a clear indication of the nas of the hadith proving the leadership of Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba hence the reason a group of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah scholars mutakallimin scholars have clearly stipulated that this was divinely appointed they have clearly stated that in their books. The overall Ahl-Sunnah uh, wal-Jama'ah position differs on that. So that's that. And the final point I would say, I really wanted the speakers to, to, to really cover the conditions of the sulha. Why did Imam Hassan agree to a peace treaty? What was the reason behind it? And just, I want to mention one point, which was... I personally believe Imam Hassan's stipulation behind the peace treaty was to do two things. Why did he resign and why did he make a peace treaty? And I will conclude with these, Dr. Bujani, inshallah. Number one, I believe the peace treaty was there. Why? For what reason? Why did Imam Hassan make it? Was to expose the opposition. Similarly to what the Prophet ﷺ did in Hudaybiyah. He wanted to expose the Quraysh for two-facedness, for treachery and so forth. I believe Imam Hassan wanted to do the same thing. He, and that's the reason he said, don't change the sunnah of my grandfather. Okay, stop killing the supporters of Ali. Stop, and, and another point which wasn't mentioned, Imam Hassan clearly stipulated, said, stop cursing my father from the member. This was a condition from amongst the conditions of Imam Hassan. And the second reason I believe that the reason why Imam Hassan abdicated was to fulfill the hadith, the hadith prophetic revelation of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I do believe that. And I think a massive injustice was done similar by the Abbasid and by the Umayyads and afterwards by many scholars under one pretext, which, which was to give number one legitimacy to Muawiyah and to give legitimacy to Yazid, I believe. Wajazakum uh, al Thank you very much for your time. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, as ever, a um, very, very important and useful contribution. Um, so Can I just a quick response? Go for it. I think... Um, it was very useful that Sheikh uh, mentioned those points that I, you know, though historical sources actually, you know, Shia sources at least state that refutes that argument that he, he was stabbed and, you know, there was that uh, dispute, you know, violent fight among the, the him and his followers because of the, you know, there are lots of issues with those traditions. And the second issue in terms of the, the, <clears throat> the abdicating or making that peace treaty, I think Muawiyah from the beginning didn't uh, didn't want to fight because he's a clever man and he knew, he knows the consequences of fighting with the grandson of the prophet that would ruin his his legacy and he would shake his his, his legitimacy as a ruler so he was that's why he was giving a blank check to Imam Hassan and he he actually created lots of um, effort to, he made lots of effort to force Imam Hassan into abdication and from the Imam Hassan's point of view, simply he just didn't have, you know, support of people and he couldn't fight. You know, he, he wanted to fight from the beginning, he wanted to fight, but he couldn't fight because he, he didn't get the support of people. And he, if he didn't have it, you know, when we say, okay, he's right, injustice is done, but people did the injustice to themselves. In, in, you know, it's not that Imam Hassan suffered because he wasn't, uh, chosen as a leader because as, as uh, that's why I included Imam Ali's statement that his the, the leadership is not more valuable than his old shoes for for these individuals because they don't after they don't after they are not after uh, power influence or glory they are after you know for them it's the duty to 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 help people but if people don't want to be helped then the people are the loser Imam Hassan is not a loser I think we should uh, we should have that understanding. That's that's I wanted to uh, point out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, I will bring Sheikh Atta back in again. Uh, but at the moment, I want to take some other comments 
um, from our colleagues. So I see Sayed Hussein Murtaza, who's joining us from Qom. Uh, Sayed, you're welcome to, please. If you prefer to speak in Urdu, I'll do my best to translate when necessary. لیکن کچھ سوال ہیں کچھ سوال کیا ہیں بلکہ کچھ تجویز ہے کہ بات یہ ہے کہ پہلے تو تاریخ کے سلسلے میں چاہے وہ سلیم حسن ہو چاہے سکین ہو چاہے کربلا ہو چاہے جمع ابھی بہت زیادہ غیر جانبدارانہ تحقیق کی ضرورت ہے کیونکہ بہت سی چیزیں ایسی جو تاریخ میں ہمیں ملتی ہیں جیسے ابھی ارا صاحب نے بھی کہا کہ جناب عبید اللہ نے عباس کتنے لوگ لے کے چلے گئے اور یہ بہت بہت اس طرح یہ تاریخ میں ملتی ہے اور اکثر محققین نے یہ باتیں نقل بھی لیکن میں سمجھتا ہوں کہ یہ باتیں جیسا کہ اطابق صاحب نے اپنی بات کی گفتگو میں کہا بھی کہ تاریخ کو بہت بس کیا گیا ہے اور سیاست کے جو خوش آمدی لوگ تھے ان لوگوں نے آ کر تاریخ میں بہت سی تبدیلیاں کی ہیں یہ واقعہ میں نے محسوس بھی کیا اور کن تاریخی گوشوں کا میں نے مطالعہ کیا اس میں مجھے بہت ہی نئے معلومات ملے گی تو اس کے سلسلے میں اگر ہم اس بات سے ہٹ کر کہ شیعہ عقیدہ کیا کہتا ہے اور سنی عقیدہ کیا کہتا ہے ہٹ کر یہ تحقیق کریں کہ واقعہ یہ واقعیتیں کھینچیں اور کس پس منظر میں اس کو کس طرح تبدیل کیا یہ ایک بہت بڑا معاملہ ہے کہ جس کو آج ہمارے پاس اتنے ٹولس ہیں کہ ہم ان پر تحقیق کر سکیں اور ہمارے پاس ایسے اسکالرس بھی ہیں کہ جو اس کو ڈگ آؤٹ کر کے صحیح طور سے لوگ سامنے پیش کر سکتے ہیں خط نظر اس کے کہ عقیدہ کیا ہے میں دیکھیں ایک بات بہت اہم ہے کہ عقیدہ ہمیں یہ نہیں بتاتا کہ کیا ہوا عقیدہ ہمیں یہ بتاتا ہے کہ کیسا ہونا چاہیے کیا ہونا چاہیے کیا ہوا یہ تاریخ کا کام ہے جب ہم تاریخ کو عقیدے سے مکس کرتے ہیں تو بہت سی چیزیں جو ہے وہ ہم سمجھنے سے قاصر ہو جاتے ہیں اس لیے تاریخ کا ہم مطالعہ الگ کریں عقیدے کی بات ہم الگ کریں دوسری بات جو اطابق صاحب نے فرمائی اس کے بارے میں میں یہ عرض کروں گا کہ یہ جو خلافت کے چند طریقے اہل سنت بیان فرمائی اس کے بارے میں اہل سنت کو یہ سوچنے کی ضرورت ہے کہ آیا واقع اسلام ایسا حکم دیتا ہے کہ کوئی حاکم ظالم فاسد فاجر اسلام کے قوانین کو پائمال کرنے والا ہو اس کے باوجود مسلمان اس کی اطاعت کریں حتیٰ کہ وہ علماء بھی جو سال ہیں وہ اس کی اطاعت کریں اور یہ نظام اس طرح چلتا رہے اگر ایسا ہو تو پھر وہ قرآن کی آیت ہے کہ اگر حد حق ان لوگوں خواہشوں کی پیروی کرے گا تو وہ مست ہو جائے گا یا رسول تم نے اگر ان کی بات کو کیا تو یہ ہو جائے گا تو پھر وہ قرآن کے مفاہم کو ہم کیسے گنجائش دے سکتے ہیں اسلام میں پھر تو دیکھنا پڑے گا کہ اسلام کا اصل نو مطالعہ کرنا پڑے گا کہ آیا رسول اکرم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم نے تو تعلیمات بھی دیے تھے یا نہیں اور اگر دیے تھے تو ان کی کوئی اہمیت تھی بھی یا نہیں تھی یہ بہت بڑا مسئلہ ہے کہ جس کو ہمارے برادران دوسروں کو سوچنے کی ضرورت ہے پھر دوسری بات یہ دیکھیں ہم اگر یہ کہتے ہیں کہ خلافت الہی ہے تو اس کا ایک نبوی سے رشتہ جڑتا ہے لیکن جب آپ یہ فرماتے ہیں کہ خلافت چورائی بھی ہو سکتی ہے اور ایسی بھی ہو سکتی ہے اور پیسے بھی ہو سکتی ہے اور باپ بیٹے کا خلیفہ بن جائے تب بھی ہو سکتا ہے اور اگر بیت کر لے تو فاسق و فاجی بھی ہو سکتا ہے یہ اگر تاریخ کا آپ دقیق دقیق مطالعہ کریں تو آپ کو معلوم ہوگا کہ یہ شاید عموی دور میں بھی یہ باتیں نہیں تھیں یہ باتیں اب باسی دور میں خلافت کو استحکام دینے کے لیے آئی ہیں اس سے پہلے ہے کہ علماء نے یہ باتیں نہیں کہیں یہ باتیں بہت بات کے علماء نے کہیں کہیں بھی ایسی باتیں نہیں کی یہی تین چند ہیں جو میں عرض کرنا چاہتا تھا اس کے بعد میری گفتگو ختم مولانا تھینک یو آپ کا بہت دو 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 چیزیں میں کوشش کروں گا اس کو ترجمہ کر کے اور وہ آئی تھنک از انف فار اس ٹو موو دس ڈسکشن آن So, um, wow. so if wow. I could, uh, 
try my best to um, summarize the two key issues which um, Sayyid Hussein Murtaza is raising. Um, after, of course, having thanked the, the, um, both speakers for their contributions, um, his, his initial concern is that there is a um, prevalent um, ambiguity and mixing of historical issues with theological ones. So he acknowledged the contributions of Sheikh Atabek, where um, Sheikh Atabek recognized that we have to be skeptical about our historical sources, particularly in light of their political influence. And so he acknowledged the contribution of Sheikh Atabek and um, making that point. However, he um, argues that we are in a um, position right now where we need to reinvest in researching to um, have a better understanding of what actually occurred during those times. Okay, if you like, through, through a re-research of history, acknowledging that the sources that we have have theological bias and theological implications, is it seems to me, for Molana, not enough. That should be an impetus for us to re-examine those sources in light of their potential theological understandings to better understand what happened and to ensure that we have a clear division um, between theology and history. On his um, second point, which I think is more directed to our um, Sunni colleagues, and we can hear a response from Sheikh Atabek initially, is that if the Ahlul Sunnah are accepting that there are these multiple modes of appointment of a legitimate Khalif, which includes um, Khilafa through Ghalaba or through overpowering another, such that initially the acts of that subsequent um, Khalif were, in Sheikh Atabek's words, initially sinful, but subsequently legitimized through their overtaking of power. And um, does this allows for a Farsiq, a Fajr, to hold authority over the Muslims, including the Salihin of the Muslims and the Salihin of the ulama, for example. So the um, Sayyid Hussain, what does it ask us, is this really consistent with the Quran? And how does the um, Sunnis okay, reconcile this or challenge this? Because it seems in his view that this is an idea which was not present even at the time of the Umayyads, but and has only developed subsequently. So um, forgive me, those Urdu speakers um, amongst the ulama who are present here will realize that I haven't done a, a great job, but I hope the um, key... Mashallah, Ahsan. Okay, so thank you. So I, I hope the key concerns have been um, been made clear. So maybe I can invite Sheikh Atabek to comment initially, and any of our other Sunni colleagues are, are welcome to contribute to. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Obviously, there were quite, uh, uh, I would say, like big uh, cocktail of uh, statements actually came from three, four different sources. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, obviously, as I said by myself, I do not trust the historic. I don't trust history. Okay, that's my point. Yeah, and I'm skeptical about everything and anything unless otherwise is proven. Okay, so that is my main stance. And um, um, uh, and also with regards to uh, and also some of uh, some of the mashayikh or some of the brothers or some of the people from uh, audience mentioned that um, uh, among so no one uh, no one was confirmed um, by Rasulullah to be. Uh, a khalif except uh, Imam Hassan. Obviously, that hadith does not mean that because hadith, the actual text of hadith is saying, Inna ibn hadha sayyid wa la'alla allaha sayyuslihu bayna ta'ifataini azimataini min ummati bihi. Oh, come on. Means my, um, my son, Ibn ibn so my son, this Hassan uh, ibn Ali, is sayyid. Sayyid means respected person. And it is very possible Okay, that Allah may bring two big, large groups of my nation to come together. Okay, so obviously in this hadith, nowhere it says that Imam Hassan is going to be Khalif. Okay, but it's confirming two things that he is Sayyid, Sayyid means respected. It doesn't say Malik, doesn't say Khalifa, doesn't say anything else. And bringing two um, groups together, you don't have to be a Khalifa. Okay, and actually, otherwise, could be proven because. Um, uh, Imam, um, so uh, hadith does not say that um, it's very possible that um, he will um, um, bring his group 
and the opposite group together. But he's saying, so there are two other groups and he's not one of them, but bring them to you understand. So hadith does not mean that, that's one thing. But also um, uh, this issue of uh, questioning the dignity of Imam Hassan um, in terms of um, marrying a lot, you know, so obviously it is slander, okay? And Ahlul Bayt has been, um, all of the prophets and their descendants have been slandered by this all the time, you know, and even, it is in some of the, uh, I'm not going to mention, in the collections of a hadith that Imam, uh, that Rasulullah tried to rape some women, you know, that all of that is lie. They accused Imam Ali by that, they accused uh, Imam Hassan by that, so all of that is just lie. So that is another thing. And also with regards to, can um, Fasiq be, um, um, uh, for example, a uh, leader? Okay, so I would say, is it consistent with Quran? So actually, Quran says that Yusuf alayhi salatu was salam, prophet Yusuf, was um, minister of economy, okay, under Fir'aun, okay. So, and so, so that, that is quite, you know, uh, that's quite a clear thing, you know. And also, um, with regards to uh, Ken Fasiq being um, uh, uh, Khalifa, obviously, we Ahl Snow Jama'a, we believe that Khilafa, was 30 years, okay, and after that it was kingdom. So um, we may say Khilafa uh, Abbasiyya, Khilafa Umawiyya, but that is by Majaz, metaphorically, okay. However, um, uh, scholars, top scholars have confirmed that the kingdom has started by Muawiyya, right? because Khilafa, 30th year of Khilafa, Khilafa Rashida, ended by the resignation of, of Imam Hassan. Okay, so that is another thing. And also, can the leader be uh, disobedient? Practically, yes. Um, theologically, I say yes, because preventing the mess and bloodshed is more important than appointing or electing the uh, righteous leader. Okay, if you just look into the history of human being, you find only few um, episodes in which um, the, the leaders, they were very pure and righteous. Okay, so it's, um, uh, it's either Prophets, Dawood alayhi salam, okay, uh, or uh, some of the righteous kings, okay. So, in the history of um, Islam, I can speak only about Samanis, okay. Um, there were maybe short periods of very good, you can say, leadership here, there, okay. But the actual thing in the Islamic um, uh, history after the Khilafah Rashida, I would say just Samanis, okay. Well, Allah knows. Yes, so that's why I, I do still hold my uh, skeptical uh, position in which I do not trust the historical uh, books and historical sources, but I read them all, definitely I read, to contemplate and to try to analyze, but never to trust and believe and to take for, for my aqidah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheikh Atabek, for, uh, for those responses and comments. Um, there, there are a number of people, I know they've been waiting, whose hands have been raised, um, and um, please bear with me. And, and bear with each other. And I think each of the contributions so far, although they've not necessarily all agreed, have been very, very useful and fruitful. And we still have half an hour to continue, inshallah. So I try to move with, uh, um, you know, in, in an order with which I'm seeing um, the responses. But, uh, you know, I have a few questions and comments and often I don't get the opportunity to share them when I'm chairing the session. Um, so I, I will hold back because there's so many people raise their hands. So we will move to um, Sister Fatima Agha. Assalamu alaikum, respected scholars. Um, my question is that if Imam Hassan let go of the idea of fighting Muawiyah due to the fact that he hardly had any companions due to betrayal, we do see that Imam Hussein still went ahead and uh, did fight in Karbala despite the fact that he didn't have adequate support. So how do we understand this? And um, if this was done by Imam Hussein, Hassan alayhi salam as a maslihat ilahi, then how much can we rely on the idea of divine intervention in the matters of tangible political issues? Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that um, very direct um, question. So I think I will pass that on to uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Saif ad -Din. Although, of course, uh, the issue of the betrayal of Imam al-Hassan by his supporters seems to be something which is concurred upon by both our presenters today. So, um, Dr. Saif Adin, would you like to respond? I try to address, I preempt this question in the sense that, of course, they have the both Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein had almost the same conditions. If Imam Hassan had 
going ahead with, with the fighting, then probably that's what's going to happen to him. That was his destiny. Or maybe Moavia was was more um, uh, lenient. He did. He wouldn't want to. Uh, he wouldn't want to to create that kind of legacy. But the problem is here: the the position of Moavia and the, the difference between Moavia and Yazid. You know that in the in the treaty agreement, one of the conditions uh, was that that Moavia would would respect the uh, Quran and Sunnah. So as long as as long as um, the ruler, uh, or in, in the, such an early state, I'm not going to make a general statement because this is going to get it's going to get political. But in the early stage of uh, a religion, that in under that conditions, if the ruler respected the religion and allowed people to learn and like like the uh, um, uh, the imams were allowed to preach their the religion teach people the correct religion and uh, that was okay for them that was uh, okay even if people didn't want to support them and didn't didn't follow them there were people who would want to listen to them and there was no reason for them to fight against for imam hassan to fight against muawiyah because of his uh, observation uh, of the religion sharia but yezid wa wasn't willing to do that he was he was a uh, uh, <laughs> He was a very unscrupulous person within the religious definition. He was a religious person, and he he wasn't observing Sharia or or anything like religious. He would do just what he pleased to do. So this was a position that that Imam Hussein was left. He was he had to either pledge allegiance to someone who who just refused the, any religion and set a precedent for Muslims. So that was a crucial point for him. That that point was has to, had to be made. That he was he stood up. That was his duty and his position. He, that's what he had to do to stand up and um, make a mark on the history that with his blood that so that people wouldn't diverge from the from the uh, true religion of the, of God and the, the religion that the Prophet has taught. Otherwise, I think if we go into this kind of uh, idea of explaining everything with destiny, then you can't blame Muawiyah or you can't blame Yazid because it's, it's the destiny of God then. How can we blame or any any uh, any of the, the um, oppressors we can't or evil person, we can't, we can't even then blame Shaitan and Iblis that because of uh, what he did because it was the destiny of God. I think uh, we have to be clear in, in explaining this, these kind of issues. It seems um, Sayyid Jafar is now with us. So after Sayyid Jafar, I will come to Dr. Fadla. Please, Sayyid Jafar, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thanks for the uh, both uh, respected scholars for their, uh, represent, uh, their presentations. Uh, I have only some uh, points that I think uh, they must uh, be taken into consideration in order to analyze this critical stance of Imam Hassan. And I think, I think the analysis of these issues is very important because uh, just, uh, just uh, being uh, only in the historical incidents will, will lead, I think, to some a misunderstanding uh, because we know that the history was written in many different uh, hands and uh, from many perspectives uh, and we don't trust of course of all what is mentioned but i think to go uh, going to analysis uh, is is very important uh, because uh, we need to understand uh, for the sake of our our lives actually and our issues that we, we face. Uh, the first point I think must be, uh, that must be taken into consideration is that we are talking about a very early uh, uh, stage of, of time of Islam. Uh, and I think any deviation of this, uh, of any stance, any decision that uh, is that uh, that was taken or well, that that must be taken at that time will uh, will uh, affect all the uh, history uh, history uh, 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 trip uh, let me say 
the line of history will be changed will be changed uh, uh, due to any any wrong or, or right decision at that time i think this is very important point we are not talking about after for example a time which is after maybe uh, a, a century or more than century after the strengthening of the society of islam we are talking about a very early stage of islam and i think this is very important the second point i think that must be taken into, into consideration is that the uh, stage of Imam Hassan السلام, was just after the stage of Imam Ali. And we have seen that we have many problems, many big issues in this stage, the stage of Imam Ali. Uh, we are talking about the inheritance of the army and the society as well uh, by Imam Hassan السلام, after Imam Ali. And this inheritance uh, of this society and the army after the Battle of Safin and the Battle of Nahrawan. And we know that the, the problems of that, uh, that stage uh, are, uh, were facing as well the Imam Hassan and um, causing the, um, let me say, it, causing the uh, very critical situation of Imam Hassan at that time. Uh, the uh, third point that must be taken into consideration, because we are talking about the early uh, stage of Islam, that every religion uh, has to have two conditions in order to uh, go forward. The first, uh, we must, uh, it must have uh, the, the book uh, which states and declares these rules, the values, the uh, morals, uh, the standards uh, that will guide any representative or any, any person that, who, who uh, must apply Islam on his, uh, on his stance and his, his, uh, his maybe actions, whatever. So this is the first, Al-Kitab. Uh, and the other uh, condition is, or the pillar actually, two pillars, not only conditions, the second pillar is the represent, representatives of, of Islam. Uh, we, when we, we, we cannot talk only about that we have, for, for example, the Holy Quran, uh, that we, we know from the verse of Quran itself, verses of Quran themselves, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Alladina Kafaru said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا نُزِّلَ عَلَيْهِ الْقُرْآنُ جُمْلَةً وَاحِدًا كَذَلِكَ لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُوَادًا uh, uh, also, uh, uh, the Quran refused, uh, denied uh, that the, uh, there must be only a book that, uh, that is revealed to, to the people. There must be a representative. Anyway, what, what I'm going, I'm I trying to say. Just focus your, your, your comments. Yes. I, I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say that uh, Muawiyah previously was assist, assisting, uh, assassinating the uh, believers who are representatives uh, of the real Islam, as, as we think, we, we may all, all think about them. And so the assassination of the followers of Imam Ali uh, was also representing the, uh, an assin assassination of uh, the representatives of Islam. So there, the representatives were in danger. According to this, according to this, Imam Hassan was forced to agree with the Sulh at that time in order to preserve Islam due to conditions. The first, uh, not to mislead the understanding of the Quran itself, uh, because the understanding was uh, going through the representatives, also to preserve the rest of re the representatives in order to um, uh, give the um, power to Islam to go forward. This is what I'm trying to uh, to say, and I think uh, uh, only only this point. Thank you. Shukran Jazeera. Shukran Jazeera. Say sorry for rushing you. Uh, uh, it's, it's a valuable contribution as ever, as ever. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I could bring in um, Dr. Um, Falal Ahmad, please. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, thank you to uh, the presenters and to all those who contributed. Um, indeed, very interesting uh, discussion to discuss about Imam uh, Hassan, uh, Hassan Rabiullah um, is a, 
figure that uh, both the Sunni and the Shia uh, hold for him a great respect and, and honor. Um, I'm not going to go through any of the detailed um, uh, historical events because I think these are for historians who are studying that. Even that, even then, it's uh, uh, challenging to go back in history and know what actually happened from what was constructed for different motives. But we can, I can see that um, uh, uh, the agreement that at the end, uh, uh, Imam uh, Hassan, radiallahu uh, anhu. Uh, Imam Hassan radiallahu an, he was a uh, Khalifa, uh, and from the Sunni perspective, he was the fifth Khalifa that is mentioned in many sources, including uh, Ibn Kathir and others, by the uh, hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that the brothers, uh, the scholars uh, mentioned before, of the 30 years that is mentioned in Khilafah. Uh, we know in the Islamic political thought, uh, uh, studying back Khilafah was the during the uh, early stages up to Imam uh, Al Hassan radiallahu anh, after he uh, gave the leadership to Muawiyah, or you know after the, the abduction or after the agreement on the leadership to move to 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 Muawiyah, uh, uh, then uh, it's not Khilafah anymore. We agree that is not Khilafah anymore in the term of Khilafah Rashida. So is the Khilafah in terms of the title? as a political leadership, but is moving towards kingdom. It's moving towards other nations, like in Sham and what was happening in Sham, the way to lead. But to say it's Khilafah in the term of the essence of Khilafah Rashida, like uh, uh, based on Shura and based on, uh, uh, on, on, on on how it was during the time of Abu Bakr عن, and Umar عن, and, and Uthman and Ali عن, then we know that is up to uh, Imam uh, Al Hassan, that was uh, uh, Khilafa. Uh, but Nabi mentioned that that if we want to uh, uh, to go forward with our political thought, we need to go back at the time of Khilafa before Muawiyah, and then we study that that time and what can we learn from it in terms of justice, in terms of freedom, in terms of other things. What I can learn from uh, this event of uh, whether uh, he was the external pressures that put him to decide that actually the best action is to have sulh with, with Muawiyah and to give the leadership. I think this by itself, without going into the detail, that we learn how uh, Imam Al-Hassan radiallahu anhu, Imam Hassan radiallahu anhu, has a great uh, fiqh of understanding uh, of, uh, of disagreements and how to resolve things based on maqasid al-sharia, the objectives of sharia. So to go into uh, when there is not enough to defend this kind of the, the, the Khilafah, that he was a Khalifa, legitimate Khalifa, then uh, going into war, what type of uh, corruption could happen as consequences at the, at the time on the Muslims and on the Ummah uh, uh, as a whole. Uh, so he put the, uh, the, the benefit of the Ummah as a whole uh, in front uh, of his own individual uh, interest and individual uh, 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 individual uh, uh, leadership kind of opposition, and this by itself is great lesson to learn uh, from Imam uh, Hassan radiallahu anhu. And also, Imam Hassan did not compromise on principles. Uh, he uh, he actually was working for the best, for the benefit, to not to shed blood and and of the mu'minin here and then. Uh, so in this by itself. He was firm on his principles, but uh, he was ready to to face the oppression when he went out uh, from Kufa in, to Al Madain, and then uh, the situation changed, the circumstances changed, and uh, they came into a sulh. So he's not someone that is out of uh, weakness or out of uh, uh, cowardness or out of he did that sulh. He did that sulh, and he actually with I think with the genius. Um, uh, and also with selfless uh, uh, sacrifice from his side, actually to look for the Ummah instead of looking for his personal interests. Uh, for the uh, point of uh, Al-Mutaghallib... Final yeah, comment, uh, sorry to push you, Doctor. Yeah, very, very good. Uh, for uh, Imam Al-Mutaghallib, I think this is very contentious issue within the Sunni thought, political thought itself, when we cannot generalize and say the Sunnis, they accept it as it is, because it holds within it the problem of revolution against the leader. So if there is a, a, a group of people who revolt against the leader, legitimate leader, then uh, they, are, they are fine when they become, and this is by itself is discussed within the Muslim political thought, is still discussed because it 
it's actually lead to oppression and it leads also to uh, revolution and uh, to 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 uh, uh, up uh, up uh, evil in you know, revolution against the, uh, the, uh, the authorities by so it contradicts itself within itself it contradicts itself so it's not something that is not given all the uh, sunnah uh, are, are are accepting this uh, but it is there of course it is there and it is uh, very controversial and 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 is discussed now uh, within the sunni uh, circles and why we came through the situation we have at the moment uh, and that is not only to the Sunni. If you go to the Ibadis, the Dawla Rustumiya, you find that as well. Jazakumullah khair and wassalamu alaikum. Thank you for, I think, that very, very important contribution Yeah, I, I, on all three key points. And on the third point in particular, it was something which I had in my mind actually to pass back and ask for Sheikh Atabek's comments that although I think he referred to later um, Ijma amongst the Sunni Madahib, um, it, it seems there are debates where um, people who would position themselves as Sunni are problematizing this ijma and looking at the early period and asking, is, are there actions of Muawiyah giving license to political rebellion? Okay, and problematizing the later ijma. Um, so Sheikh Atabek, I don't know if you would like to comment um, on that specific point, the last point made by Dr. Falah, um, about the internal diversity amongst the Ahl Sunnah on this issue and some of the other issues which have been raised since you last um, spoke. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Fella, Dr. Fella, um, you know, uh, they, uh, within Ahl Sunnah, let me just start with the Khilaf, uh, you know, with the like uh, consensus and other things. Um, obviously, Asari Muslims, they do believe that um, uh, the women, they have half brain. However, we Hanafis do not believe in that. We actually said that Ali al-Qari mentions uh, just in response to that argument that uh, there are women whose brain is much more higher than the brain of a lot of men. I think uh, Dr. Rafilla is the, the best example for that. Thank you very much. You know, in the very beginning uh, of my presentation, I already mentioned that many people, when they think about Islam, they think that Islam is two groups, Shia, Sunnah. No, 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 no. Within Shia and Sunnah, so many disagreements, you know. So you cannot classify us into the uh, you know, two boxes. Again, uh, on the same way, when we say Ahl Sunnah, so many disagreements. Okay, so even this issue could be also disagreed, you know, with regards to the rebellions taking over, Mutagalliba. Will he be legit or not? Okay, however, um, um, uh, there are, uh, exactly, uh, uh, Dr. Fella mentioned that in quite a lot of sources it is confirmed, you know, and the proof of that is all of the uh, Khalifs, okay, Abbasids, okay, Mamluks, Saljuks, Usmanis, all of them, how did they come into power? Isn't it by Tagalub or not? Yes, but all of them are classed, even by metaphorically, Khalifa, however, by consensus, their class is head, leader. Regardless if it is, this leader is called president, prime minister, king, etc. Do you understand? So practically everyone agreed, you know, to obey. Uh, but anyway, um, it should not be. It should not be um, uh, considered that um, Ahl Sunnah say that rebelling is permissible. No, no, no. Rebellion is not permissible. And it is one of the major sins. Okay. And um, I did uh, upload uh, when this uh, rebellion started in um, Arabian countries, I made something about three or four hours lectures in which bringing all of them proofs from Quran, Sunnah, and the schools of thought, fiqhi books, you know, uh, uh, with regards to the prohibition about the rebellion. Okay, and as far as I remember, entire, quite a lot of Muslim scholars, I don't know about Jafaris, but Ahl Sunnah, they supported the rebellion saying, yeah, 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 you know, well, obviously. Um, our books say no, no, no. So this yeah, yeah is coming from uh, emotional reaction, but academical uh, reaction to this type of evidence says no. Rebellion is major sin, bloodshed, not permissible. Okay, so 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 that's my comment. So uh, <coughs> consensus is big cl claim. I never, uh, I try to um, not to claim as much as I can, you know, uh, in terms of consensus. So definitely um, there will be disagreement about uh, most of the issues, but consensus. If there is consensus, so yeah, it's good. But if there is no, it's not it's not that big issue. Quran and Sunnah and Ishtihad is good, uh, sufficient, you know, 
just to uh, place the consensus. Thank you. I'm sure you have more to say here, Sheikh Atabek. Um, um, but unfortunately, our time is coming short. And some of our um, colleagues have been very patient. I think Sheikh Hassan Gulvani's hand was up very early. And I, I, I'm, um, I, I'm remiss for, I think, not giving you the correct order. So please, Sheikh Hassan is joining us from, I think, um, Sweden or somewhere in Scandinavia. Please, you're welcome. Sweden, that's correct. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bojani. And thank you to both the uh, speakers for your presentations. Um, I'm going to be very brief. Um, one thing that I, uh, I've i missed, and maybe I'm going outside of what the topic was, but, but correct me if I'm wrong then. Um, look, this it's very good that everyone is agreeing and, and we seem to, everyone seems to be quite uh, together with what's happening and so forth. Uh, people are being killed in parts of the world because of their view on this issue. You go to Pakistan and you say that Muawiyah was wrong and you are doing Tohina Sahaba. Uh, you go to the Shias and you see Imam Hassan did bay'ah to uh, Muawiyah and you're no longer a Shia. There are serious issues here that I feel hasn't been dealt with. In, my, in the past, when I've discussed this issue with, with Sunnis, I've always been told that, look, you have to accept that Muawiyah was a pious man. Why? Because Imam Hassan did bay'ah to Muawiyah. My question to uh, Sheikh Atabek is, um, how important is it in the Sunni theology to, or, or, or the Sunni worldview that the Shias should accept Muawiyah as a pious person because Imam Hassan, or even generally, but spe specifically looking to the point that Imam Hassan uh, uh, abdicated. And then to Sheikh uh, Kara, um, how important, did actually Imam Hassan give bay'ah or was the abdication just abdication without a bay'ah? I hope my, my questions are clear there. Yeah, very clear and I think very, very important and appropriate. Um, thank you very much. It's just a beautiful question. Obviously, again, uh, I do not speak on behalf of entire Ahlul Sunnah. As I said, Ahlul Sunnah is not one school of thought. There's so many schools, you know. Actually, we have contradictory schools also. For example, Mujassims, Hanbalis, okay? On one side, we Maturidis, Mufawwid, okay? Munazis, on the trees, two opposite things. So um, do not... Um, think that I represent the entire Ahlul Sunnah. Everyone represents himself. I um, uh, I uh, really love early Hanafi school. Okay, so let, let's take it like that. Okay, with regards to um, um, uh, believing in the righteousness of the Sahaba, okay, um, is it part of Aqidah? Obviously, it is included into the texts, into the manuals. Okay, for example, Aqidah Sahawiyya, Fiqhul Akbar, and Jawhur So all of that is mentioned, okay? However, is it the matter of belief or disbelief? No, it's not the matter of belief. And I'm aware that um, it's quite sensitive issue, you know. So, so that's why uh, when I was invited to this um, uh, event, uh, I came with intention of trying to um, uh, trying to just warm up, you know, our um, relationship, which was just, you know, uh, so frozen, you know, for uh, centuries. Um, however, it is not fundamental. Okay, it is not fundamental. Um, uh, our main stance is um, the Muslims, regardless. Okay, Sahaba, non Sahaba, the righteous Muslims. Okay, so uh, backbiting, slandering, okay, cursing. It's not something that uh, um, uh, genuine people should be doing. Okay, regardless if it is the uh, uh, people who died already or who are still alive. Okay, so that, that's that's it. But anyway, if someone slanders, okay. Is he kafir or not? We say kufr will be applicable only uh, with regards to uh, the Sahaba. Uh, I'm sorry, with regards to the prophets, okay, and with regards to Sayyida Maryam, okay. And some of our uh, Mashayikh mentioned that also with regards to Sayyida Aisha because she has been purified uh, by Quran, okay. So she has been stated, okay, clarified by Quran. However, besides that, um, slander. It will be major sin, but not a kufr. Okay, so that's one of those things. Yeah, my my understanding from that is to say, you know, if I was trying to understand the response of Sheikh Atabek and rephrase it to uh, to to Sheikh Hasnain, is that the, the 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 there is a tension between the um, textual Sunni acceptance of respect for the Sahaba, okay, and some of the actions. Of the um, you know which we are discussing today of the likes of of Muawiyah, okay the problem and, and if that was to lead those that that tension 
okay, should not lead to cursing of those individuals. Even if it does, that cursing doesn't take them outside of the fold of Islam. So if I've understood Sheikh Adab correctly, um, I, I believe that's what he was trying to say to Sheikh Hasnain. But now I'll turn to um, Saif ad -Din. Do you have a response to the other horn of, of um, Sheikh Hasnain's question? I think uh, people don't kill each other for um, certain uh, faith that they have, certain certain idea or belief that they have for the whether in, uh, Imam Hassan uh, pledge allegiance to Muawiyah or not. People currently they are killing themselves, killing each other because of, you know certain groups are exploiting these weaknesses and they are you know profiting influencing you know making um, accumulating you know uh, influence and power based on these these tension points of the of the ummah so i think we should be we should be you know um, we should be careful about this nobody kills each other you know muslims are living together for a very long time and they don't nothing happens unless something some political activity happens in that area then they start killing each other because those political groups they are trying to advantage of those those uh, weaknesses. So I mean, I think you know this is my first time I'm attending this meeting, but I've been to um, intrafaith dialogue before, and uh, I was involved in bringing together Pakistani groups. You know, they are fighting with each other, they are killing each other, and when they come together, you know, I, I was participated in those uh, meetings. They don't speak at all. They don't. They just blame outside powers. So here, I think there is an engagement, and I. Within the within the good limits, I think there's a very good discussion is taking place here, and I don't know it might lead to better you know more engaged discussions. In terms of uh, answering the question of whether Muawiya uh, Imam Hassan pledged allegiance to Muawiya or not, I think he didn't pledge allegiance because in my readings it was a treaty. It wasn't a, a, a pledging a, a allegiance. You know it, it, that that wasn't that kind of um, um, gathering because. I remember there was a few other uh, parts that he uh, he was Imam Has Imam Hassan Muawiyah was expecting him to pledge allegiance and he didn't. But there was an agreement. He he left. Uh, he didn't want to fight. He didn't fight with the Imam with Muawiyah, and he made a peace. Definitely, he made a peace and he acknowledged his authority. I mean, whether he pledged allegiance or not, but he, he de facto acknowledged his his political authority at least, and. Um, and based on that, that you know, he 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 did what he could do. I think. I think that, that, that if we want to address this, you know, this is a I think a dialogue. You know, it's we are trying to understand each other. So in that sense, this is good. But if you want to resolve those kind of killing each other, you know, those kind of killings or violence, those are I think should be dealt with the locals who who are who are, there are you know there are different issues are happening on the ground there. And you know specific issues, and mostly politically charged uh, issues. I think we should also consider that in these kind of um, engagements. Thank you, um, Dr. Saif ad -Din. So um, you know, time is really, really running to a close. Um, you know, one of the reasons I think um, you know that Alhamdulillah, people come back to this is that we, we try to observe our time, and um, but unfortunately, that means that the only two people who have their hands still up. Um, we'll have to, um, you know, keep their comments brief. Um, Sheikh Omar, you have your hand raised, please. Uh, just very quickly, I know time is extremely limited and we are very cautious of timing itself. I would have said that we have to recognize within Ahl al-Sunnah wal Jamaat is diversity. We can't say one view, and I appreciate what's been said. Regarding rebellion, are you allowed to rebel against governments? There's a vast majority some scholars say, for example, yes, it's allowed. Some of the Sunni scholars said, no, it isn't allowed. And that's a debate amongst itself. But what I would say, bringing it back to Imam Hassan, very quickly, I don't believe that he gave bayan. And that's confirmed by Imam Asiyuti in his study. He says that, and he actually uses this term naib. He used that, that Imam Hassan was the Khalifa and his deputy was Muawiyah. And that was a term that he actually also used after Muawi became a leader. I think what we have to be very careful is legitimizing barbaric uh, rulership uh, across the board. As Muslims, we cannot do that. We have to be very firm and say what is right and what is wrong. There's a lot of issues to be said, but finally, I would say we have done an injustice to Imam Hassan. There's a massive injustice to him within Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. 
recognizing his greatness. And that is why Sheikh Mamdoud said this, the great Egyptian scholar. He said, if you come across any narration, and this is my final 30 second point, if you come across any narration regarding Imam Ali, Imam Hassan al Hussein, which shows them in a bad line, he says, really be extremely cautious regarding what they are. Uh, hence the reason why I think uh, we have to uh, debate more longer. But again, I thank you and I thank all the scholars. There's a lot of more things I want to touch on and reply regarding the hadith, but we don't have time. I know we don't have time and I'm not going to go there because that would be insulting uh, everyone. But Jazakallah khairan to everyone and all the scholars. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Sheikh Omar. Um, now. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Sayyid Hamid. Okay. Sayyid Hamid, please, if you could just, in, in, in 30 seconds, make your key point, I would be very grateful. I know, I'm sure you have more to say, but I would request yes, you. Yes, um, unfortunately, I have a lot to say. And uh, first of all, thank you to everyone. I uh, just wanted to mention that, uh, uh, thanks to Sheikh Atabek, he mentioned in an answer uh, that preventing bloodshed is more important than appointing the righteous uh, Khalifa, uh, which was... Uh, uh, spot on, but very strange to uh, apply this to the Saqifa, where there was no bloodshed taking place, but not applying it to Imam Hassan's uh, scenario where there was plenty of uh, bloodshed. And in fact, asking the question that, uh, you know, if Imam, Ali, Imam Hassan was the uh, righteous appointed leader, then how did he resign that? So uh, the answer is quite clear. I think he sort of answered that. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we say that Imam is appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the political apparent leadership has to be given to the Imam by the people. As we have narration that uh, the Imam is like the Kaaba, it is the duty of people to come to the uh, Imam. Now, when it comes to um, uh, Muawiyah here, Mu there's, a, there's a history of Abu Sufyan versus the Prophet, Muawiyah versus Imam Ali and Imam Hassan. Sayyid Hamid, murder of you've already gone beyond the time that I've, I've <laughs> allocated you. So please, I know I, you'll have to forgive me this time, but um, if you want to make one key point, then I can move on to our final contribution. Uh, thank you very much. I think the key point is that despite the clear deviance in Muawiyah, unfortunately, he was successful in uh, changing some of the key points in the Sunnah of the Prophet and establishing some of the key tenets and foundations of the Sunni school of thought. And the question remains, why do the Ahli Sunnah, despite admitting to the clear errors and mistakes to be very polite in terming what Muawiyah did, why do they still uphold those same uh, foundations that uh, were established by Muawiyah? Thank you. Shukran, Jazeel. And again, forgive me for, 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 for pushing you. Sheikh Arif, and then I'm going to give Sheikh Atta back um, a chance to respond. Okay, and um, a final word from... Um, Dr. Um, Saifuddin, and we'll close. So, Sheikh Arif, again, I'm going to have to ask you to be as brief as you can. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ali, and our two wonderful presenters. Um, listening to the issue of uh, Bayah, it just comes to my mind that uh, one of the justifications for the occultation of the 12th Imam has been that every Imam has some form of Bayah to the ruler of their time. And therefore, in order to prevent the 12th Imam from having bay'ah, he has been kept in occultation. So that was one of the sort of theological reasons extended by people like, say, Bakr al-Sadr, and I think it's uh, developed from a hadith of the 7th or the 8th Imam. Now, in light of that, isn't it possible that bay'ah only means pledge giving uh, allegiance to a political authority in the sense of not mounting an organized rebellion against them. In that sense, Imam Hussein did not pledge bay'ah to Yazid. And therefore, when he was confronted, he defended himself. Or he was advancing to Kufa to raise an army against Yazid because he wasn't under the pledge of uh, bay'ah. So bay'ah does not mean legitimizing the divine authority of the Khalifa and giving them that theological status. Bayah simply meant not to mount a rebellion. I was just wanted us to just consider that if not now, then maybe next time round. Shukran Jazeela. Shukran Jazeela, Sheikh Arif. So if I could turn to our uh, speakers for a concluding comment, and particularly Sheikh Atabek, if you wanted to respond to the direct question, and I think important question of Sayyid Hamid, um, as to despite the acknowledge, clear acknowledgement um, which, is a, which has come from this, which is implicit in our discussion today, 
the Imam Hassan was the legitimate caliph. Okay, and um, Muawiyah's position was that of Baghi, and this continues from our dis previous discussions. Um, how do the Ahl Sunnah, although you've discussed some of the theories for the legitimization of um, Mulukiyah or some form of Khilafah after the Arashida, how do the Ahl Sunnah account for the influence such leaders had on Sunni thought subsequently? Sheikh Atabek, please. And, and, and any con concluding thoughts? Okay, so anyway, you know, uh, it's very important because uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, these uh, opinions are dividing us. That is, that is, I'm not for it. However, it is very important during the discussion to not to twist, you know, and to not to attribute to the speakers something which they never said. Okay, so when I said, um, for example, um, non-righteous leader becoming uh, uh, if he's appointed he's legit and never refer to Saqifa okay so uh, that is um, I'm very badly offended by this statement okay because uh, I do believe that uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq is very righteous person okay so do not um, uh, do not play with the words okay so I'm not ex I'm not accepting this type of games okay anyway um, uh, 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 can, I just, can I just step in there I think that's a good and important um, clarification Sheikh Atabek yeah so thank, thank you for making that point yeah. Because we are here to set up warm relationship and not, you know, to you did this. You, I'm not for it. You know, I'm academic. Give me proofs. Let me look into it. But I'm this. You are that. So I'm too too old for that. You know. So, so again, we don't want to. We we don't want to um, also misrepresent um, Sayyid Hamid. But if that's the impression he gave, um, then um, I, I think your your clarification is legitimate. He's mentioning in his quote in the chat box right now that he feels he was misquoted as well. So I think let's try the discussion away from each other. Yeah, so and, and please check out the back. Yeah, uh, but but anyway, I'm badly offended. Regardless, whatever you say now, it does not does not change what you said. You know, but anyway, you know, uh, um, it's all of that is based on historical sources. Did Imam Hassan make baya or not? Okay, so if you just look into. Um, uh, what is mentioned uh, in the um, uh, Sunni historical points, obviously, I don't believe in history in piety, you know, Sunni Shia, all of that is history, you know. So in the one of the conditions of Imam Hassan uh, for the agreement was that after Muawiyah, Imam Hassan is going to be Khalifa. So if that condition was included, uh, it gives impression that most likely he uh, did uh, go for the bayah. But then again, as Sheikh Arif mentioned, uh, bayah in itself, is very ambiguous statement. What does it mean? Does it mean that um, uh, making bay'ah means that you are appointing that person as spiritual guide also or not? I personally don't believe so. It's a political thing, isn't it? Okay, for example, now most of these people could be living in the Western countries, you know? Um, uh, so, um, and you are living politically, you are obeying the law of the land. So does it mean that all of you guys are uh, unrighteous and all of you are disbeliever? It, it's too much, you know. So let's not overstretch the theology. Okay, so it's just too much. Okay, forget it. So anyway, um, um, so, so that is... Um, Any concluding uh, thoughts from you? Any concluding thoughts from you? Yes, so, so anyway, it, it is really good that we are meeting up to have very lovely uh, conversations and trying to not to accuse one another, you know, because these accusations is everywhere. You know, we're just fed up, you know. I think it's enough. Enough should be enough, you know. So, so that's, that's my thing. Thank you very much. Anyway. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Saifuddin, please. I, I think I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Sheikh Atabek. And I also, um, I mean, he's praised everyone tonight, but he's the star of the, I think, tonight's event. He's done a lot and he's actually, you know, engaging with these difficult subjects. It's, these are difficult subjects and even coming together and then discussing them, it, it takes a lot of courage. And um, in that sense, I, I, I fully agree with him. And we shouldn't expect, you know, this is this is the point of we can't, we are not, we cannot correct history, and because we don't know even that that history, you know, that, that it took place, these events took place at at it was at, at they were portrayed. So we should be more careful about our expectations, you know, our expectations as as Shay Atabek clarified that you know talking and having warm relations, establishing warm relations. Because we have lots of uh, discussions on Muslim Christian relations, you know, it's very, you know, everybody's fancies. But then let's talk about our own problems, you know, the problems of the Ummah. So, in that sense, I, I congratulate everyone who participated in, this meet in these meetings. And I hope you keep up with this and uh, 
and you know create these warm relations and uh, have a better better uh, unity and um, um, you know for the Ummah, inshallah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Saifuddin and Sheikh Atabek. So it's typical at this point, and for me to try and bring together some points of 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 conclusions yeah, and consensus, which is not always the easiest task, because as both of our speakers and something which has been emphasized by the contribution from the Ahl Sunnah is, of course, we have internal diversity. You know, even in um, Saifa, um, Dr. Saifa Dean's presentation, he showed there's different ways these incidents have been interpreted um, by, by, um, by, by Shia scholars and, of course, um, Shia masses at large. And we've had that point very clearly made that there's diversity amongst the Ahl Sunnah. Okay, and there are emerging debates, there are new debates which have take on new relevance as we look around the world today. So concluding from this is not always as straightforward as somebody would like, but there have been, you know, some clear agreements. Of course, we know, and you know, Alhamdulillah, many of us have been participating in this forum regularly. And, um, you know, we, 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 we genuinely try to hold this gathering in that spirit of collegiality and to forgive each other, you know, when we do offend and to learn from each other's offense when we come back next time. I would ask us all to take that very, very seriously, that comment that I've just made, and that we learn when we do, even if it's without intention, to offend each other. And that we are here quite explicitly gathered, okay, to discuss difficult issues, which doesn't mean we will always agree, but hopefully we will always have something to learn. There was clear points of agreement the status of Imam al-Hassan, the outstanding status of Imam al-Hassan, although for um, the, the Shias, his status as Imam uh, and leader is through his divine designation through the Prophet, Okay, whereas for the Ahl sunnah it was through his legitimate appointment as well as the outstanding fadail which have been mentioned for him through prophetic traditions, the status of Imam al-Hassan is beyond question. Both of our um, speakers and the consensus which came through the conversation recognized that his was the legitimate Khilafah. Muawiyah's move against him, okay, was a move of rebellion. However, once that authority transferred to Muawiyah, and this is the major point of difference, okay, at least apparently, okay, that is seen as legitimate by the Ahl Sunnah in light of their th different theories of Khilafah. With this, um, abdication there is of course been much discussion about the details of the peace treaty now neither of our speaker got into these details to a great extent and that's largely as has come through um, is a, a, a skepticism over the historical sources now if we look at even the fourth century sources okay and late third century whether it's Yaqubi, Mas'udi, Tabari, Dinawari, Ibn Atham al-Kufi all of these mentioned conditions but none of them agree on the conditions. So I think both of our speakers were right not to focus on those historical details. Nevertheless, we know that ultimately, okay, there was a moving of transfer of power to Muawiyah. Okay, the justifications for this were not seen as being problematic by the Ahl Sunnah. For the Shias, they're interpreted in light of those sources, in light of its historical context, and in light of the theological standing regarding the Imams of Ahl al-Bayt. Both Shia and Sunni agreed that the um, Imam al-Hassan was betrayed by the vast majority of those people who supported him, and that his actions were in line with the spirit of Islam, the spirit of his father, and the teachings of his grandfather, Rasulullah. So we thank you all okay, for your contributions. We have raised many other kind of peripheral issues today, which are worthy of more explore, exploration. Um, and we hope we will have the opportunity to do so, to host you all in person, for us to build not just friendly relationships. This, is, this should be an assumption for the Quran describes us as brothers, but to actually build relationships where we can learn from each other. We are, can critically engage with each other, okay? And hopefully, hopefully make some small contributions to the wider problems which we deal with and we know are being dealt with around the world today.